Uh, we've been in a, in a series of messages uh, on the minor prophets, which I know you read those a lot. You ponder them, you kind of go through those in the Old Testament, and really kind of devotionally. Um, and, I, and I have to confess that this was not my idea. Jeremy, <laughs> the minister that the Lord gave me, <laughs> uh, Jeremy came up with this idea and thought it would be really great if, if uh, you know, we preach uh, out of the Minor Prophets on Sunday morning and then follow up with the same one only doing the Bible study on uh, uh, Tuesday nights. And so that's been going along. And, uh, but I don't get the advantage of having gone through the Bible study first before I preach. So... We don't know if what I see in here is actually right. That gets corrected on Tuesday nights usually. So, <laughs> but um, we're in Habakkuk, and uh, Habakkuk is uh, is kind of a, the opposite of most of the prophets because most of the prophets would get a word from the Lord and then go out among the people or the powerful folk and would <laughs> proclaim that word of the Lord to them. All right? That's that's happened over and over again. We've seen that the last few weeks. Habakkuk is different because what he does is he listens to the cares of the people and then goes to the Lord and says, let me tell you what the people are saying or, or let me ask you the questions that the people are asking. So it's almost like a reverse prophecy. And, uh, and the questions that he asks are probably some of the most uh, profound and um, appropriate questions that, that we would ask in our own lives today. So there's nothing, um, you know, historically indifferent about it. Um, let me begin reading in, in the beginning of chapter 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. Here it is. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Okay, that's the first question right there. How long must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. <clears throat> Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Their strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Those are pretty good questions, aren't they? Lord, pray with me. Lord Jesus, teach us. Teach us how we can freely come to you with our questions and then have the courage to hear your responses and to, uh, and to walk with faith and not necessarily with certainty. Teach us from this uh, obscure passage in the Bible. Show us how we could, we could live in you. That's our prayer. That's our need today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, sometimes uh, uh, people have come to me over the years and, and they feel like there's something wrong with them or with their faith because they have these questions. And usually they're fairly big questions. Um, if they come with small questions, then usually they're just conning me. But... Um, but there's some big ones that people struggle with. And I remember we had a, we had a, a, a lady in a Walnut Creek Church who attended the new members class uh, once each year for about five years. And every time she'd go through the class and then she'd make an appointment and come and see me. And she had written out a list of her questions. And, and she's brilliant and everything. And so she would sit and I'd sit there and go, no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you ought to ask God that one. Uh, and, uh, and this went on for about five years. And then w one time she just totally stunned me by actually getting up in front of the congregation with the new members class, the fifth one that she'd been through over five years, and joined the church. And she didn't come back and ask me any more questions. I think she finally realized that I just didn't know. And so if she had any questions, she ought to go to the Lord directly. Which actually is what Habakkuk is teaching us in this. It's totally all right to go to the Lord with our questions, with our issues. At no point in this does God respond to Habakkuk and say, what a loser you are. Why are you asking me this stuff? What, you know, didn't you get that in Sunday school? Never. 
In fact, he always takes it seriously and gives really full answers, not necessarily the ones Habakkuk wanted. But evidently what was happening in the land was that there was outbreaks of violence and uh, battles everywhere, couldn't trust, the, the system was corrupt. Could you believe a, a political system that had corruption in it? I, I, I was stunned just to read about this. I know how far we've come. And uh, destruction, violence, there's strife, there's conflict abounding, the laws paralyzed, justice never prevails, the wicked him in the righteous, justice is perverted. Why do you make me look at it and you, and you don't do anything about it? Well, those are fair questions. Now, God's response is um, kind of uh, surprising to me. Instead of saying, don't worry, I'll take care of it all, he says, don't worry, I'll take care of it all in a way you probably aren't going to recognize. And so he says, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days, in your time, that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, the ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the earth and seize dwellings that are feared and dreaded by people, a lot of themselves. Their, their horses are swifter and fiercer and anyway, on and on and on. So basically, and, and uh, Babylon was the, uh, uh, now where Iraq is uh, today. So they're saying the Iraqis are going to come down and destroy your land. That's my answer. <laughs> you want to see? All these problems you have in your hometown, they're going to be wiped out. So don't worry, I'm taking care of these people who are being violent and cheating and disruptive. I'm taking care of it by bringing a bigger, badder group in who are going to wreck them. So don't worry about it. I can just imagine the back is going, okay, okay, wait, let's start over again. Okay. <laughs> Second time through here, Lord. And, but, but, uh, and, and Habakkuk was a little bit um, take, taken uh, by surprise in this. And uh, it goes on and on in chapter 1 about uh, how much the Lord hates the evil and the violence and the misuse of justice and the corruption and all of the things that goes on. And then he says this, um, The revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. Wait, wait for it. It will certainly come, and not delay. Now, any of you ever had a, a dog? <laughs> a trained dog? Yeah, we have one that flunked the training. You know, we spent thousands of dollars on dog training, and they finally said, this one has an attitude problem. <laughs> <laughs> My dog! <laughs> My, ah, what a surprise there. But some of you have dogs that actually do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. You ever done that thing where you put the biscuit on their nose and you do that, wait for it, wait, and they do, not ours, but others, and they kind of wait there, and then you say, okay, and they kind of knock it off and catch it in their mouth, boom. That's what God's doing here with a backache. I, this is going to come true. The things you're asking about are going to be taken care of. But it might linger. So wait for it. Wait for it. It doesn't mean it's not coming. And then in verse 4 uh, of chapter 2, there's this uh, verse that has been quoted in the New Testament um, in several places, and that is that the, the righteous are going to live by faith not by having everything figured out in advance. Not by having the timeline or the chart or all those different things that make our life feel like it's secure and safe and taken care of. You live by faith, which means you have to wait for it. Wait for it. And then you see what God does. Now, I personally would question God's wisdom at this point. I would say the righteous should live by 
having it all together because we're better than them. But I looked in this verses over and over carefully in the Hebrew and, and I didn't see that. All I see is the righteous will live by faith. <coughs> that means that we've got to live in a context in which we don't see God's hand always working the way we need to see it. And yet we still would trust. We still would say, all right, Lord, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm taking you at your word. I'm trusting what you're saying. This is going to happen. And, and I'm believing that you've got a plan and that you're staying close. I'm waiting. That actually is the picture that, that God is giving us here of what our lives should look like. Not that we know everything, that we've got it figured out, but that we're saying, Lord, I'm waiting for you. Your timing is going to be okay for me. It doesn't feel right, but it's okay for me. And I will live by faith. Now, personally, I'd rather live by insight. That's never been an option. Uh, don't have much insight. And, uh, and sometimes I think I ought to live by uh, figuring stuff out and having a plan that seems to make sense. And you know, that hasn't worked too well either. So I'm looking at him going, well, maybe, maybe actually what this says here in Habakkuk is actually true. We are going to live by, by faith. And now I was thinking about this because he then lists uh, these things that, woe, woe to these people, these people, these people. He talks about all the bad people around. And it's not very positive, okay? You know, if you like positive thinking, this, you don't want to read Habakkuk. Um, Woe to those who pile up stolen goods and make themselves wealthy by extortion. Woe to those who build their realm by unjust game, gain. They plotted the ruin of people, shaming their own house and forfeiting their lives. Woe to those who build a city with bloodshed and violence and establish a town by crime. Woe to those who get their neighbors drunk so they can look at their naked bodies. That's what it said. I'm just reading this. I didn't write it. <laughs> Don't let your children see this. You know? So it looks like a porn site to me. Not that I've ever seen one, but. And woe to those who have their little idols and they say to the wood, come to life, wood, or to the lifeless stone, wake up, stone. Can it give you guidance? So he's got these five woes. And I started thinking, okay, so I think we would all agree that the modern day Habakkuk, who, you, I think we would agree that this person is probably the closest thing to Habakkuk that we have. The prophet who, who speaks to God on our behalf and tells the truth, talks straight to us about real life situations and how bad the people around us are, right? Dr. Phil, <laughs> right? And the modern day prophet? Uh, I, so I went to the fountain of wisdom uh, Eileen and I were watching Oprah interviewing Dr. Phil. You have these two icons of, of wisdom about life and, and spirituality. And uh, Dr. Phil has a new book. I guess that's why he was on the show, maybe promoting the book. I don't know. Life Code, in which he talks about we've all been raised to give people the benefit of the doubt. Right? People are good. You work with them. And all the good people prosper. And he says all of that is totally false. In the world we live in, just like Habakkuk, people are wicked and evil and malicious and abusive and they're all around you and they're taking advantage of you and you're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt and you wonder why your life's getting totally screwed over by them. This is Dr. Phil Habakkuk. <laughs> Phil. And I thought, I must know more. <laughs> so last night, I didn't have time to run down to Barnes & Noble so I did something that I don't usually do, and that is I cut out a computer. Hmm. And uh, okay, so here I'm kidding. Let's see if this works. Okay, I want to read some of this. It's better to be awakened by a painful truth than lulled to sleep by a seductive lie. That's Dr. Phil. That's not Habakkuk, but <laughs> he goes. Um, let me just read a little bit about what he says here. Do you wonder why, after you've had an argument with someone, you're inevitably the one who always feels guilty and apologizes when you know, I mean, you really know that you did nothing wrong. 
Worse still, have you wondered why that person in the next cubicle, who you know to be a backstabbing, brown-nosing, manipulating, sycophant suck-up, <laughs> he's saying that in the most positive way, <laughs> got the promotion or the credit that you deserved? Or why you get taken advantage of and flat out betrayed by the very people you trusted and thought were your friends and allies? Or why your child is always the one getting bullied at school? Or why someone suckered you once again by selling you something you didn't need, a price you couldn't afford, or by borrowing, taking your hard-earned money with some sob story and never paying it back? Or why you lost your husband to someone everybody but your husband, duh, knows to be a scheming gold digger. Worst of all, do you ever wonder why people get away with lying, stealing, cheating, or emotionally or physically abusing someone you know or love, or even you? I'm a pragmatist. I only want to talk about what you have a chance to change because that's the only part you should put energy into. It doesn't do any good to just sit around being upset about it if you don't make the effort to figure out what, how, and why it happened. You can be, this is Dr. Phil speaking, not me, you can be madder than a snake that married the garden hose. <laughs> He's from Texas. Ah, <laughs> uh, the snake who married the garden hose. But that won't change reality. <laughs> to do that, you have to get street smart savvy and recognize that the world rewards action. Well, Dr. Phil Habakkuk. <laughs> Actually, that's exactly what our, our passage is talking about here. We've got to recognize what the real world is. And they aren't just filled with good people getting better, all looking out for each other. Actually, some bad stuff going on. And how do we live in this? The righteous are going to live by faith. That means we're going to stay in there and wait for God to act. And he may act in a surprising way. He may bring down the Iraqi forces and wipe out everybody. Not our plan, but he will take care of the problem that way. And then it goes on to say, and then I'm going to wipe out the Babylonians. I'm going to wipe out the Iraqi forces because they're just the same. They're just bigger and better at it. Now, At that point, Habakkuk gets the big picture. He doesn't get hung up in the, why are you bringing in a bunch of meaner, badder, worser people to take care of the mean, bad, worse people that we have? Why, why would you do that? Instead of getting that way, he sees that God's going to use one group. He's, God is Lord of the others too, right? He can use the foreign invaders just as much as he uses our local invaders. And, uh, and then he takes care of them. And when Habakkuk sees this, it's like he goes, oh, you're bigger than all of it. And you can solve this problem or that problem. You can wipe out this group or that group. You can do whatever you want, Lord. And you've promised that we will live by faith as we wait for it, as we stand in there. <coughs> And then Habakkuk comes back with a song. He must have been a guitar player or something because the very last thing in here is, uh, this is for the director of music. Play this on your stringed instruments. <laughs> so uh, I guess he was a guitar player. Most of them are prophets, you know. But um, <laughs> So he says in this chapter three, three, three affirmations. We, I mean, The Lord is going to act. The Lord is going to act. And his glory is bigger than we can imagine. It, it says it, 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 like the waters cover the sea. That's how the Lord's glory is going to cover us. Now, listen to this. This is actually probably one of the greatest expressions of living by faith. 
Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there's no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. Even though, even though we don't see the signs, even though the provision doesn't seem to be there, even though it seems like we're in trouble, even though it seems that we have nothing, I'll be joyful in, in uh, God my Savior. And then he says this, The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on to the heights. How do we live even though? I mean, everyone, we could sit down here right now. We could make a little list of our even those, right? You can sit down and write them right out. Oh, this is happening, and this happened, and this happened, and that, and this thing's taken care of, and we never, you know. And you could go down and you could make yourself a really good list. But could you start at the, in the margin then and write in even though? I see a homework assignment developing right now, see? Yeah, see? So you make your list of all the things that you struggle with, that you question, that, you, that cause you to wonder if you should even trust in God, and then in the margin on the, on the left, put down, even though, even though, even though, even though, yet I will trust in the Lord. Because he makes In my life different. Now I didn't get that part about the deer's feet. Um, have you ever seen a deer's foot up close? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, when we lived in, uh, in Edina, Minnesota, we lived across from the wildlife preserve and so they come down the hill. It, we, it's like, you know, minus 10, so it's kind of sunny springtime, you know. Uh, and the sun would be shining and it'd be like minus 10 out there and we'd look out the window and there'd be like these three deer just behind our house on the hillside. Now I can't walk up that hill. I'm slipping and grabbing stuff and pulling myself up and they're like bouncing around and I'm going, this makes no, because if you look at their feet, it doesn't make sense. Now I didn't go to veterinary school, okay, so maybe there's something, but it's like, it's almost like hooves, right? <clears throat> Not hobbit feet, not big flat ones. You know. they're, they're like hoofs. And you go, well, what the heck? How can they get anywhere? How do they stand anywhere? I don't know. But he says, see, so God's saying, he's going to make my situation just like that, irrational. It's irrational that deer feet can get them where they need to go. I'm not even going to talk about those goats on the mountain rocks in Colorado. My gosh, they're up there. They've got the same feet going, you know. And, and I'm, I need Velcro just to watch them. And uh, so he's saying, this is irrational to us. It makes no sense that the deer's feet, with feet like that, that they can go boink, 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 boink up through the hills and stuff, right? So that's what it's going to be. It's, your life is going to be spiritually irrational. It's not going to make sense. How can I live in these situations and in spite of that, and how can I still trust God, and how can I live by faith when there's all of this going on? That doesn't make sense. That's almost irrational. Yes, because God's going to make that happen. It's not going to be something you and I are going to figure out and, and, and solve because the life situation is too big for that. It's something that God's got to surprise us with. And one of the ways that he surprised us, when, when he broke into our world in a radical way and interrupted us, interrupted our stuff, and interrupted our mindsets, and interrupted our strategies, and interrupted our everything, and he broke into our lives in Jesus. And then, and then we see Jesus gathering his followers together and, and, and then taking the bread and breaking it and said, this is, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. 
that's not rational. That we would receive Christ into ourselves, into our lives, and into this trouble, and into these, this confusion, and all of those things, and we would still find that he is with us, and in us, and strengthening us, and nurturing us, and nourishing us, <laughs> Maybe we don't even have to wait for it anymore because he's here now. <laughs>